probably the lesson there is just truly expect the unexpected. You know, look farther, look deeper, look around that corner just just for signs that that may occur. And you know, I can I can tell you with respect to you know why it all happened. Um, you know, it's pretty clear once you start once you start looking at it, you're like, okay, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, but you know, with respect to those, with the lesson learned from this one, it's, you know, even, even when you do everything right, you can still sometimes be wrong. Stay tuned. Coming up in this episode is part two of my two-part interview with Clearview Fire and EMS Chief Rory Payman, sharing the details of a residential dwelling fire near Miss where he was caught in a fireball due to rapidly changing wind-driven conditions. But first, let's hear from our amazing sponsor, Midwest Fire. Every day, hardworking men and women at Midwest Fire build the most reliable firefighting apparatus to be found anywhere. Their customers know a well-built fire engine means lives and property saved. Midwest Fire, a factory direct manufacturer dedicated to helping you extinguish fire before it becomes a raging beast. To learn more about what fuels their passion, visit MidwestFire.com. Today's show is also brought to you by the Situation Awareness Matters Online Academy. The Academy trains and certifies your team members on situational awareness skills essential for improving high-risk decision-making outcomes. To learn more about this highly acclaimed program, visit SAMatters.com and click on the Online Academy tab under the training section at the top of the homepage. Hello and welcome to episode 298 of the Situational Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this program is to help to improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments, with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you and your team members see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from my office in St. Paul, Minnesota, having just returned from delivering a situational awareness program for the fire chiefs of all of ExxonMobil's North American operations. Today's feature segment is brought to you by Sims you Share. Sims you Share is a simple and affordable way to help you develop and practice situational awareness skills. You can quickly build Sims from your photos to simulate almost any kind of incident, including active threat scenarios. And the new Sims you Share Command Training Center now lets you conduct multi-company drills over the internet so you can even run drills while your companies stay in station. Check them out at SimsYouShare.com. All right, let's jump into today's feature segment, part two of my two-part interview with Clearview Fire and EMS Chief Rory Payman, sharing the details of a residential dwelling fire near Miss where he was caught in a fireball due to rapidly changing wind-driven conditions. You know, when you got outside, well, I think when you got outside, you just continued to do some work because didn't you say you then advanced the line around to the back of the house? Were you were you aware of just how how much damage was caused to to the gear that you were wearing? You know what? I really wasn't at that point in time. And uh, so, yeah, so we proceeded, you know, back to the seaside or the rear of the house and, and kept working. And then it was a, kind of at that point, um, just just the way we were spread out geographically, it's you know, you have a couple of trucks initially, but then everybody's about the same distance away. So it just started stacking up. And then I think at that point, we kind of had the fourth, fifth and sixth truck all show up at the same time. But again, it was just one of those things where it was that it was that fire, you know, where we just didn't have a lot of staffing available. And I think even on those trucks, you know, one of the tankers coming in had uh, one guy on it. Uh, another one had uh, three. And then uh, the other one had, I think, one. Like, it just, it was just that day. So we were able to, at that point in time, that's kind of when it started to hit me a little bit. And I started just to kind of feel that drain. 
Um, so I was able to transition once again to command mode as we had a few more of those people come up the driveway. Uh, I put those, those guys on the line uh, that I was running at the back as well as they started running the, the ground monitor at the rear. And then um, everything was defensive at that point. So that line that we had initially pulled in, uh, two more firefighters were assigned to it just to try and get control of the fire. And um, again, what was the damage to the gear and were either of you uh, injured, whether you realize that in the moment that you were or not, it were, you know, was there any injuries to you guys? I saw, I saw the pictures and there was, you know, obviously quite the thermal assault on your, on your um, face piece and radio. Yeah. And you know, the, it was actually interesting to, to kind of look at my helmet afterwards and it had actually melted. It started to melt the shell of the helmet, um, which was kind of interesting. I had a, a new uh, Scott, uh, I don't know what they are, if they're still AV3000 high temperature face piece, but it actually started, it had alligatored the face piece. So it had kind of started to melt. Um, the, I was actually pretty surprised considering, you know, the amount of time I was forward, but just the difference of turning around, um, the, the blistering that occurred on the SCBA cylinder, as well as, uh, you know, the, uh, just the gauge had, the plastic gauge had melted. Um, my gear itself, it ended up just pretty classic. And, you know, as somebody who is, is you know, what interested in how this stuff goes, you know, this was the one that happened to me, I guess. But, I, you know, I've certainly read up and seen a lot of this stuff. And it was kind of interesting to see, too, just where everywhere there was compression is where all the burns were, right, um, where, the, where the SCBA straps were. Um, it had burnt them. In, and I did send it away um, just for testing, just to kind of see. And, and absolutely, it was... It was pretty well destroyed. Um, you know, my gloves had kind of burnt up a little bit and there was even a spot in my flash hood that uh, had started to melt at the back. So uh, it was very, very interesting to see. Now with respect to, I had a bit of a burn on the back of my neck um, and probably the biggest burn I had, which was probably about the size of your fist, was actually on my right side. And it kind of threw me off and it was somebody else that had suggested it to me um, but they had said, you know what, that's exactly where your SCBA buckle is on the side. So again, I think it was kind of a compression thing where everything was compressed the most and, and ended up with a burn there. So um, outside of that, you know, I don't think for a second, I don't realize how lucky we were. Uh, and especially when, when you look at the gear and how that all played out. And I think, you know, after the fact, you know, when you said, you know, did you kind of say to yourself, well, did you think this is it? I don't think I ever really realized, you know, just how serious it got until I seen the face piece. And I've seen a lot worse face pieces in, in this stuff. But, you know, when you turn around and you look at, you know, this is a high temp face piece and it was pretty close to, you know, being, you know, wrecked or compromised. It's like, wow, if I had made it to the bottom of the stairs, you know, that's, that's when you start to do the what ifs, right? Like, what if I wasn't three steps down? What if I was 10 steps down or nine steps down? You know, and I, and I was at that, that critical point where it's like, do I go up or do I try and go straight? And, you know, I did, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of stars aligned, I think that day, just with respect to, you know, we we're probably only 10 seconds away from, from being at the bottom of the stairs. And then we would have been in a situation where maybe we, we couldn't have got out. I did have the two out, you know, but at that point in time, who knows based on where we are, yeah. what, what happened. When you were inside, um, did you pass command to somebody outside when you went in or did you keep like a working or mobile command? You know what I, I did. I, I kept just a fa I transitioned to fast attack mode. So, yep. So kind of a working command. The deputy chief was, uh, he was arriving or he was en route. Um, but I'm telling you, Rich, like, and you know, you want to talk about, you know, somebody labeling me with complacency and you absolutely could. Um, but I looked at that fire and it was, it was a nothing fire. Like it was, I truly thought we were going to walk in there and we were just going to put some water on this thing. And it was, you know, we we're going to be high-fiving and ass slapping or whatever, you know, out in the front yard in about two minutes. Um, but, you know, when you start to look at why that happened, it was pretty clear that mm, it wasn't lining up like that that day. Now, your partner, was, was he injured at all? You know what? No, he was far enough behind me and there was just a little bit of a separation there where we kind of came down the stairs and, and he was just, you know, we, we try and do that, you know, instead of, you know, both people ganged up pulling hose, you know, we do, we're good, you know, having a bit of distance behind us. It's somebody that I have worked with a lot in the past and he was just, you know, seven or eight feet behind and he was just kind of feeding hose for me. 
So he was he was back just far enough that it, it he was just on the edge of it. Okay. Um, so from there, the fire turned defensive. Um, was there anything significant that occurred in the balance of the uh, of the firefight? Because if so, we want to cover it, and if not, I want to transition to uh, what lessons you learned, and maybe even if you were able to unpackage what caused that sudden change of condition so unexpectedly. Absolutely. So you know what? With respect to that, um, you know, we were fighting a wind-driven fire at that point. And, you know, we had, through the duration of this fire, um, you know, we had uh, a, uh, all right, so a 500 gallon a minute uh, ground monitor rock, rocking on this thing. And then we had uh, two uh, 150 gallon a minute uh, hand lines going on it. Keeping in mind, this is, you know, it's a rural fire. Um, so all the water we have with tankers, we never lost water supply once, um, but that was, we were capped out. That was the maximum we were gonna be able to flow on that thing. Uh, and uh, it, it just was not enough to, to bring it under control. It had a metal roof on it. Um, and so therefore the fire spread laterally throughout the structure. And before we could do anything, it just, uh, it just consumed the structure. It was, it was probably one of the fastest fires that I've ever seen where, you know, we've, we've ended up uh, collapsing the structure. Yeah. So how, how long did it take this to go from what you termed like a no big deal fire or a nothing fire to a fire so involved that you guys weren't able to, to, to tame it with the water that you had and what's the window of time here in this progression? Uh, you know what, in all honesty, from, from standing at the front door, kind of having that thought, to coming out of the structure and, uh, you know, going around the back, watching, the, you know, what the what these lines aren't doing. I'm going to say it was probably about, probably about four minutes is, is somewhere where that happened. All right. Um, another question. How much longer do you think you – um, would have had to been inside for the outcome to be catastrophic for you. In other words, what I'm trying to do is for the, for the listeners and the viewers, put a frame on just how close you came to tragedy. And, you know, I'm going to kind of go back to a point that I just made. And I think we were probably about eight steps away from this being a different different story to be perfectly honest with you I think I think if we had been to the bottom of those stairs and just kind of the heat and just how quickly it all changed and, and took over um, I think looking at how you know the, the ma my mask was starting to fail um, just how the heat was starting to get to me I, I truly think uh, without the without the help of our two out it might have been a little touchy at the if we had got to the bottom of the stairs. Do you think with the two out, if you'd ended up with a mayday, that they would have been able to make a difference for you? Or do you think the conditions would have been such that even having two out, they wouldn't have been able to help you? Do you know what? We did have a, uh, we did have a two and a half inch hand line off uh, out. And I honestly, I don't even know. I, I watched what, I watched what that uh, ground monitor did at the back and I, it was very little, if anything. So, I mean, you know, flown at half of that, you know, to come in and try and help us. And, and I think, you know, you know, as well as all these guys that are chiming in, you know, to try and, to try and move a two and a half inch hand line quickly enough while flowing water to try and grab, a, grab a couple of guys that are at the bottom of the stairs. It's a pretty tall order for anybody. And uh, yeah, you know what? I, I think it would have been a different day. Yeah. All right. Um, so the event wraps up. Uh, you guys, you know, head back to the station for the for the cleanup. What's the conversation like um, among those in the fire hall as they see your radio, your helmet, your face piece? What's that conversation like? And you know, it's funny because our our department has transitioned so much over the years, and just like anybody, but. Um, you know, this, this department amalgamated 25 years ago 
And, um, you know, through that amalgamation, there was a lot of people that were hired. Well, you know, a lot of those people we've seen over the last probably four years, um, you know, retire from the department. They're, you know, 60 years old or whatever. And um, actually, 60% uh, of our department has been here for less than four years. Um, and I've only got 13% of them that have actually been here for over 10 years. So it's a very young department. Um, that fire there of the uh, six of the six additional, not including myself, that I had on the first truck, um, two of them, that was their first fire. And uh, another one had only seen one fire previous because they were all active since January. Like it, so it was, it was a pretty new crew. Yeah, they were pretty green. How, exper uh, how experienced was your partner behind you? Uh, he was, a, that was actually my training officer. So uh, he's been here for 13 years and uh, he's, he's pretty experienced. Um, and then I had, uh, I had a couple more experienced people kind of uh, on the two outside of things and the pump operator. But the people that started showing up after that were, were also pretty new and inexperienced as well. Okay. So is there any conversations happening at the fire hall and the, uh, you know, they're cleaning up and your gear sitting there and any yeah. wide eyes or anything like that about, holy cow. And you know what? It was funny because uh, there was a lot of going on, eh? And you can, you know, you're kind of doing your thing and, and meandering in and out and, and whatever. And nobody's really saying anything. And you can just kind of see them looking and they're doing this and they're doing that. So it was, uh, it was kind of like a gather around my sons. And then we just kind of, we just kind of had the chat of no different, honestly, Rich, than, than what we're having right here. And I just kind of explained to them, you know, kind of what happened, what it was like, what it seen, and then, you know, how we got there and, you know, whether we would get there again, and, you know, the reality is, and when I start kind of breaking down what, what caused it to you, you know, and I keep going to myself, you know, if I was handed that exact same scenario, I would do the same thing again. And, and I think it's kind of, you know, when you see the puzzle pieces put into place, it just, it, it truly was one of those perfect storms. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, you know, I keep looking and going, what would I change? What would I change? What would I change? And, you know, from the, from the point of not being 100% confirmed that all the occupants were out of the house, seeing a small amount of fire load with, or sorry, a small amount of fire within the house, um, you know, and, you know, there's, there's departments that fight fires with six people all the time, right? And it's, it's based on that fire, it just, I probably would have done it. I'd probably do it again. So. Well, did, did you have any learning or takeaway from that, that, that you, you know, it would be able to share with someone else that said, you know, if you arrive, um, you know, look at things differently or be more inquisitive or don't assume it's a nothing fire. What are, what are some of your teachings that you would now that you've had some time to reflect back on it? It's been a month and a half that you would, you know, if I were to put you in front of a classroom of, say, uh, 30 brand new firefighters and you wanted them to learn something from this which happened to you, what would be some of those lessons? And, you know, I would have to say, obviously, you know, know your surroundings, know which way is out, know how that's going to work. Um, but when I keep kind of going back to, you know, it's still really we're still unable to determine hundred percent if the person was actually out of the home that, that had called um, the minimal fire conditions. I, I think, you know, probably the lesson there is just truly expect the unexpected, you know, look farther, look deeper, look around that corner, just, just for signs that, that may occur. And, you know, I can, I can tell you with respect to, you know, why it all happened. Um, you know, it's pretty clear once you start, once you start looking at it, you're like, okay, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, but, you know, with respect to those, with the lesson learned from this one, it's, you know, even, even when you do everything right, you can still sometimes be wrong, you know, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of the takeaway that I got from this really. Like, it's just, you know, and we've all heard it, right? You know, you go on anybody, you know, look, look at all these line of duty death things and whatever, and, you know, another routine fire, another routine fire, another routine fire, you know, everything was going as it should have. And then stuff went bad. And, you know, 
it's easy and I, and I'm no different than anybody, right? I've sat back, I've read those things and, and kind of, you know, it's easy to armchair quarterback, but until you're actually there, until you actually see that, how that routine fire goes from here to here, it, it's a tough little, it's a tough little thing to actually comprehend. What the, uh, talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say expect the unexpected. I think yep. it's a solid lesson, but unpackage that a little bit. Absolutely. So, you know, when, you know, when, when you turn around and you, you look at that, it's, you know, my expectation and, and maybe it was, you know, I formed my expectation before it even happened, you know, and as I said, you know, I pictured us walking to the bottom of those stairs, putting out fire the way we were. And that's where my head was. That's where my thought process was. You know, we were making such good headway, knocking down that fire um, that, that I literally, you know, I was picturing how that was going to look. Okay. Yep. We're going to go down here. We're going to do this. Couldn't see the fire from the backside. So there's obviously a wall that runs down somewhere to the center of that house. And you know, that was my expectation. Okay. We're going to go in, we're going to go down the stairs. We're going to find, you know, the seat of this fire and we're going to put it down. So and, one, of the, one of the situational awareness barriers is optimism. Yep. I'm coming into a situation with expecting the optimistic, successful outcome to whatever plan or tactic you are about to implement. It sounds like what you're saying there is that your, your mindset was deferring or defaulting to an optimistic um, outcome based on what you believed were going to be the interior conditions. Am I paraphrasing that right? You know what? You would you would be right, and I would probably add to that. And again, I can't I can't remember the the, the proper term that you used, and I apologize during your course. Um, but you know, on the flip side, is I was drawing from from the experience that I've had in the past, right? Where you where I've 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 done that walk 25, 30 times, right? Where you see a similar fire condition, you see a similar what looked like a similar fire, and it's just like those are the good ones, you know? Those are the ones that you. You know, you go in and it's just like, yep, yep, yep. So, you know, I was kind of picturing that and I was picturing a positive outcome. I'm kind of picturing those in the past. Like, yeah, like we got this, like this is, we got this and we didn't got this. Yeah. Connect some of the lessons since you've had the situational awareness class, connect some of the lessons that you might be able to recall that were either uh, helpful to you in this or that you would say, you know, Rich told me, to watch out for this, but for whatever reason, I was, you know, too focused in the moment of, you know, getting the task done or whatever. And, you know, um, the one thing that I, I can say for sure was, and again, I'm sort of rich, you know, some of the terms or whatever. That's all right. Um, That's but, all right. This, is, this isn't a test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. So, um, you know, with respect to blocking stuff out, you know, when you get so focused on the task, you know, you don't always hear things, you don't always see the things. And, and, you know, I can, I can remember, I can remember thinking that because, you know, I, I don't love operating in a fast attack mode. Um, but, you know, I thought based on the conditions, based on the scenario, based on the personnel available, this was the, the right move. And so I was actually very cognizant of, you know, what's going on, you know, um, what's what's water supply doing because that's a big thing for me, right? Obviously, if you're in a rural application, you want to make sure that you do have you know, a water supply established. And, and for us, as soon as we start hooking in two or three tankers, we're going to count that as water supply. Um, so, you know, I was listening for that. I was listening for trucks arriving, um, you know, so I could see how much, uh, you know, personnel we had to do whatever with, but I'm also listening for the deputy chief to arrive because once the deputy chief arrived, that's when I was just going to do a radio transfer command to him. Um, addition to that, you know, just uh, additionally to that, uh, just taking things in and, you know, like when I did the 360, you know, I, I was starting to question things as to, okay, why? Like, why are these windows and doors on the, on the backyard, you know? Um, but where I tied that in too, instead of trying to get tunnel vision on that, it was because I can remember saying, okay, well, the, the caller was home at the time of this fire. Like, they, they called from inside the house. So how is it possible that every window and door in the back of this thing is blown out? And it like, I mean, this is a house with a view, like it is sitting on the, on the, on the side of a hill that you could see, you could see for, well, for Mike Sinclair there, you could see Barry, no problem. Right. And 
So, I mean, there's windows, there's doors galore. So how is it possible somebody is sitting in this house and it goes boom and they're still able to make this call? What, right. what, was the, what was the fuel load like in the basement? Was it like an unfinished basement or a finished nope. basement? Or was, was there any storage of flammables? Or what was what was happening in the basement there? No, do you know what? It was it was a finished basement. Um, you know, I, I found out after the fact and speaking with the homeowner that he had a little bit of a workshop down there. Um, but nothing nothing crazy. Um, but looking in, it, I mean, it was a beautiful house. When I did my 360, looking in on my walk around, yeah, it was a nicely finished basement. Um, you know, there wasn't any type of hoarding issue or anything of that nature. It was, you know, just it looked like a normal house. Okay. And then, uh, so was it ever, were you ever able to make some determination as to what blew out all the windows in the back side of the house prior to your arrival? So as it, um, so we ended up bringing the, uh, the OFM, the fire marshal in um, to investigate as a result of the explosion. So for, um, for Ontario here, uh, there is definitely a couple of criteria with respect to uh, when the fire marshal is requested. Uh, one of which is a dollar loss value. Uh, one of which is if it's a vulnerable occupancy. Uh, if, and then one of them is uh, whether or not there's been an explosion. Uh, so they were contacted. Uh, they did send out a team of investigators to have a look. And as it looks, the initial fire uh, was caused by a malfunction in the furnace, a valve um, that had actually sparked an explosion, um, which, which essentially started a fire distally to the, to the furnace room. So a fire had, occur had started um, somewhere actually uh, uh, you know, further in the structure from where the furnace room was. Um, we get the call, show up again, small little fire. It's not too bad. Uh, finished my 360. If you recall, I got dressed, you know, uh, got ready to kind of go and fight this fire and a second explosion occurred. So again, what, um, you know, my investigation in conjunction with the, with the OFM, um, what we determined to be the cause for that was, um, when the, per when the furnace had blown off, the, um, there was still a, an active propane leak. And if you remember, I had said um, in doing my 360, I couldn't see a, a propane tank anywhere inside the structure. Well, it was about 40 feet away from the structure hidden in a bunch of trees. So yeah. it wasn't when you were walking around, you can just shut a valve off, right? You, you just couldn't see it. Um, so it sounds like, you know, um, the propane continued to leak and it wasn't until the fire actually now got to where that pocket of the propane was the second time. That's where the secondary explosion came from. So um, in looking at it, that is where, you know, you start to dissect it and, you know, to turn around and say, why did it happen or what, you know what, let's not say why did it happen, why, you know, why did I get caught, maybe we'll say that is, you know, so now we're at the point where we have zero control over flow path in that house at all. All the back windows are open, all the front windows and doors are open. And this is where I say, you know, and I'm not trying to make excuses here, but this is kind of where I say, you know, I think that perfect storm uh, started to play out. And, you know, when, when I arrived and when we made entry, there was no wind at all. So the, the wind around here predominantly blows from the west to the east. Uh, this house was facing the west, so the back was to the east. It was on a hill. And that wind, like I say, when I, when I looked up, uh, when I looked it up afterwards, it was, uh, it was 30 miles an hour. Um, but now it's coming unabated right into the back of that house. And unfortunately, because we have zero control of flow path whatsoever, it can go out whatever opening it wants in the front of the house. And as that wind picked up, the unfortunate part is, is we were, we were in the stairs, we were in the vent path of this, this fire, um, when, when it got enough wind to actually take off. And, you know, that is, I think that is just the point where predictability for that was very, very tough. You know, if it had been windier beforehand, you know, I would have went with my original plan, taken the time, and we would have went in the seaside of that house. Um, if I had a seen fire from the seaside when I did my 360, we would have went in that side. But, you know, there was nothing to lead me to believe the fire was even on the lower level. Um, you know, the... Uh, the fire location was not visible from the front or the back of the house. 
um, in doing the 360. So, you know, it was somewhere kind of in towards the middle of the house. But that wind change uh, with, with a lack of flow control um, and, you know, the initial indicator of where the fire was kind of dictated where we went in, why we went in, how we went in. And then the rest was, I don't want to blame it on Mother Nature, but she definitely was upset that day. <laughs> were you, when you initially went in, were you thinking the fire was on the, on the first floor, on the floor level that you entered on? Do you know what? I, I, I actually did. And again, and I'm, and I'm going to say, and that was because like, I mean, when I, when I did my 360 around the back, being a back split, you know, I couldn't see any fire or even smoke coming out of the lower level. Um, and you know, you would, you would think, and I mean, I had my head right in there. I was looking around, I hollered for anybody that was in there and there was nothing in there. Like there wasn't, there wasn't even a haze of smoke on the lower level, which again, kind of made me think, okay, I guess the fire's probably upstairs. Mm -hmm. Now as, as an instructor, um, based on this incident, would you, um, would you teach anything differently or anything new that you hadn't taught before based on having an event like this occur to you? Um, do you know what? It's was specific to the specific to the size up. Um, you know, one thing I can tell you that I, that I didn't know, then I wouldn't say it had a, a notice and I wouldn't say it had an, a, an effect on the outcome outside of the obvious. But uh, the one thing that it was the, uh, the deputy chief who noticed up, uh, he was in charge of operations on the, on the Charlie site. And he brought me around afterwards and he said, you know, have a look at this. And, and the initial explosion had actually blew the, uh, the house off the foundation about six inches. Um, so, you know, very interesting to see for sure. And you know what? I, I missed that. It was hard to see until you were looking, but on the same token, I think, you know, you know, most people can appreciate when you're there by yourself, you're doing your 360, you're looking for fire conditions, and then stuff starts throwing you for a loop, i.e. all the doors and windows laying over the front yard. You know, you're, I guess you're going to miss things, and, and, and I did miss that. But, you know, you know the lesson too, right? You preach it, but just make sure you take it all in. Take that step back, have a look, maybe do another 360, right? After you've, after you've determined that, that uh, you know, you've taken your first shot, maybe go the other way. When you when you do a second 360, you know, especially, you know, maybe not on your everyday fire, but on stuff. I mean, I knew, just as everybody listening to this knows, right? This isn't your everyday fire. When you show up and it, and it's obvious that an explosion has occurred, you know, maybe you need to approach that a little bit different, and you know, maybe doing a 360 the other way. Maybe getting somebody else to do a 360 so they can see things, right? Um, but, how long how long have you been in the fire service, Rory? Uh, Twenty years. Okay, and is this the first? Uh, residential fire that you've been on where you've had a like blowout of all the doors and windows uh, on a structure is would you call this a novel event for you having experienced that no you know what I've uh, there's one other one that for sure that comes to mind it's when I worked in a different department um, and it ended up being a uh, somebody was uh, manufacturing hash in uh, in this in this home and it was a two-story and it was a nighttime call though. And it wasn't until after the fact that we had realized that that was the case. But um, I, when we went into that one, it was, it was interesting um, because it was like a fun house and it had, <laughs> you went in and you went upstairs and all the walls were like kind of leaning over on each other and doing different things like that. And that, that is, that was the first one that I ever went to um, of, of a significant nature like that. And, but, Again, I'm going to say it was grossly different because we went in, did what we did, uh, but it was nighttime, and you really couldn't see that till you were there. To sit there and turn around, and although I didn't see the first explosion, to watch the second one, it definitely gets the wheels in motion for sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was probably the first one like that I've ever been to for sure. Okay, was there anything you'd want to share that you haven't had the opportunity to share because I didn't ask the right question? <laughs> I think you asked all the right questions there, Rick. Um, no, I would say, um, you know, this was, it was just one of those things where, you know, I, there's probably as much as everybody's going to critique me on this or criticize my actions, 
you know, probably I can safely say that there was no bigger critic than myself. Um, and, you know, where I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, I keep looking at it and say, what would I do different in, in that scenario? And I'm really having a hard time figuring that out just based off everything that I seen in the conditions at that time. And, you know, had it not been for the wind, had it not been from the direction of the wind, if the wind had blown from the, from the east to the west, like it always does there, you know, that wouldn't have happened. We would have actually been on the winning side of that because it would have blown everything away from us. Um, you know, if, if I had had a few more people on my first due truck and, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't just one, um, you know, we would have been able to, to stretch that line around the backside, which I originally wanted to do anyway. Um, and, you know, come at this thing different. Now, in all fairness, you know, there wasn't any, anything to indicate to me that the fire was down there, but on the same token, um, it was just the, it was just where I wanted to make my initial attack. Um, so, you know, that all would have been, that all would have been different, but, but to turn around and, you know, I still, as we're talking about this, obviously I'm thinking about this leading up to our, our chat here. And it's like, you know, I know he's going to ask me, what would you do different? What lessons did you learn? But, but it's like, Hmm. I, I don't know, to be perfectly honest with you. This was, and that's why I think this one's kind of sticking with me so much, you know, and I, I don't want to get to that point where, you know, you transition and you get scared of stuff. Um, you know, it's still, there's still an element of risk. There's still an element of danger and, you know, you, you still have to, you know, be prepared to, you know, you know, extend people a little bit, but, you know, with not having, you know, hundred percent confirmation that that person's out, looking at the condition of that fire. And I mean, the survivability in that house was fantastic, you know, when we arrived. So, you know, to go in, knock down the fire and, and conduct a primary search was, I mean, that was, that was the fire you were going to do that at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just, but that's kind of what gets me. And, you know, where I can turn around and say, you know, as I did say, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad it was me. Right. Cause you, you know, I, I was, uh, the incident commander of a call before for a, for a mayday call. And, uh, we had a, a group of firefighters um, that were operating at a residential fire and I got a mayday because uh, two of them had fallen through the floor. And as it turns out, they didn't fall through the floor. There was an open-ended staircase that they were walking, not crawling. Visibility was poor. So they couldn't see their feet, but they, they were walking and they walked off the, the top of the staircase and into the basement. But I can tell you, you know, that was the worst feeling I ever had. Far worse, far worse than, than what I experienced uh, during this fire. And I remember the first thing that I said to myself is, is what did you just do? You know, what did you miss? What did you just do? And, you know, I mean, I, I looked at that fire. I watched that fire. Uh, I did multiple 360s on that fire. And, you know, there was nothing that told me the fire was below them. And I can just, I can just remember, I can remember that feeling. My, my stomach's still turning thinking about this, you know, it's, it's what did you do? And then, you know, when we looked at it afterwards and uh, figured out that uh, it wasn't, what did I do? It was, what did they do? Um, but, you know, to, to sit there and, and, and look at that. And I remember the angst and, you know, the disappointment in myself that that caused me. Um, I was just very glad on this one that it wasn't somebody else and it was me because I'll tell you, you know, obviously I'm telling you the story of that one, you know, if you get, if you get two or three under your belt, there's going to come a point in time where you start to doubt yourself a little bit and it starts to, you know, affect your decisions and, and, you know, not that this shouldn't affect my decisions, you know, based off the, the, the learning experience and, and the luck that was, was handed to us that day and it will, and it has, but you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, as you have a couple of close calls and near misses with other people, just how it affects your decisions. Yeah. Uh, where was the owner? So they were out. Um, I, he was, they had some friends up and they were out visiting. So it was uh, his uh, young adult son that was, was home at the time uh, of the fire and uh, had some really inconclusive results as to where he was, what happened, how we exited the structure, um, which I'm sure anybody listening here can read between the lines and figure out where my thought process is on that one. Um, but yeah, that was, again, I, I think probably had a, 
had a significant impact as to why we were there that day. Was he injured? Nope, not even a little bit. And he left the scene? And he left the scene, yep. Okay, and we'll leave it at that. Um, all right, thank you for uh, for coming on and, and uh, being part of the show and sharing the experience. It takes it takes a, a lot of courage and some strong leadership to, to stand up and say, we had an event and um, you know, this is how things unfolded and make, and make sure that those lessons get shared with, uh, with a bigger audience. There's a lot of people who won't do that. And for anybody who stands in criticism or stands in judgment, the only thing I can say is their hindsight is always perfect vision after the fact of what could and should have been done instead of and, you know, it's very easy to stand in judgment of others um, and, and without putting themselves in the boots of the people who were on the ground that day. And you did a really good job of putting us in the boots that day and allowing us to see from the firsthand perspective what you were seeing, what you were thinking, and the, and you you took that whole event and you kind of slowed the event down such that we were able to follow along very well to what happened. And, and I think there's some really, uh, really valuable takeaways there that, uh, that you shared regarding the expect the unexpected and how we can get task fixated, um, how we can look at a fire where there isn't a lot of smoke and fire visible to us and think this is a, a nothing event or a routine event and how quickly that can turn and mostly in this case because of the uh the wind that kicked up and you know the fact that you had all the windows um you know removed and that's kind of a unique circumstance to to a fire event like that as well so thank you so much rory for coming on the show and uh and sharing your experiences to everybody who joined us on the facebook um feed thank you for coming on to facebook thanks for sharing your questions i I think I captured all the questions and, and relayed them to Rory, and uh, and I appreciate you typing in and 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 uh, sharing your thoughts and asking your questions as well. So this uh, this show is part of the Situational Awareness Matters show uh, on uh, iTunes and uh, will be posted up again on YouTube. And for that, I'm thankful to our sponsor, uh, Midwest Fire. They make some awesome fire trucks. And they, uh, they have been the sponsor of this show for nearly five years now. And uh, Sims You Share, which sponsors our feature segment, which Rory will be the feature segment for this upcoming episode, which will air here in, uh, in just a couple of weeks on iTunes and the YouTube channel. So if you don't want to miss any of these, subscribe to SA Matters Radio on, uh, on your favorite podcast player or SA Matters TV on YouTube. So, Rory, thank you again for being with us, and thanks to all the, all the uh, people that were connected with us on the Facebook Live. Oh, thank you, Rich. I, I got to tell you, you know, it was truly an honor and a privilege to uh, be on your program here as somebody who, uh, who knows what you do. I certainly appreciate it. You know, hopefully, uh, hopefully somebody can certainly take away from, from my experience here. Um, and, uh, you know, a little plug to your sponsor there, uh, three of the tankers protecting my, uh, my seat there were actually Midwest fire tankers. So oh, uh, all awesome. right. thanks for delivering the water Midwest. That's awesome. I will, I will be sure to reach back <laughs> to Midwest fire and make that connection for them. They're, they're, they're going to love, 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 love hearing, hearing that, that plug for them. And that the Midwest fire tankers were, were part of your response. So thanks for mentioning that. For sure. So thank you, Rich. Okay. Thank you again to Fire Chief Rory Payment for sharing your near miss experience with our listeners and viewers. And thank you for sending all of your officers through our Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. Remember, this was part two of a two part interview. So if you missed last week's episode, be sure to swing back and check out the lead up to the lessons learned in today's show. I launched the Situation Awareness Matters show back in 2014 with a purpose, to give a platform to those who've experienced near-miss events to share their stories. When I'm on the road delivering Situation Awareness classes, I often ask attendees about the near-miss events that they've experienced, and they have shared some absolutely amazing stories. 
Their stories motivated me to launch this podcast so those lessons could be shared with a bigger audience. You. The Situation Awareness Matters show podcasted as SA Matters Radio and our companion video program, SA Matters TV on YouTube, along with other audio and video programs we've posted there, have enjoyed more than one million views and listens. I am so honored to provide a free platform for these incredible lessons to be shared. And if you like the show, please do me a solid favor. Subscribe. For the audio version, search for SA Matters Radio on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and iHeartRadio. If you prefer to watch the show, subscribe to SA Matters TV on YouTube. And if you find value in the show, I would really, really appreciate it if you would give the show a rating and write a review. Your ratings and reviews help others to find the show, and more importantly, your feedback inspires me to work even harder for you. Since 2007, our instructional team and consultants have helped more than 1,300 organizations and have trained more than 86,000 individuals to improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, public transportation operators, aviation workers, oil refinery process operators, biotech workers, and more. If someone you know works in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, then we are here to help to improve their safety and to help them accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home from work whole and healthy every day to the ones who love them. I'd like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent situational awareness training for their team members. The Colorado Department of Transportation, a biotechnology firm in Rhode Island, the International Association of Fire Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Officer Section Symposium in the Sun, the County of Grand Prairie Fire Services, the Florida Fire Chiefs Association Safety Conference, ExxonMobil's North American Operations Safety Managers, the Sandoval County Fire and Rescue Services, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. If you're interested in attending a program, here's where we're going to be upcoming. First, I'm taking some well-needed family time off for the holidays. Then, on January 8th, I'll be doing another industrial consulting project for one of the world's largest producers of rolled aluminum products. That'll be in New York. January 11th, the Lincoln County Fire Chiefs Association in Denver, North Carolina. January 30th, the Evans Fire Department in Evans, Colorado. February 5th, the Miami Valley Fire and Rescue Conference in Dayton, Ohio. February 7th and 8th, the South Carolina Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Columbia, South Carolina. February 24 through 27, Firehouse World Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you want to see all the locations of all the upcoming events, just head over to our website, samatters.com, and click on the red tab that's about halfway down the homepage labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. If you're interested in talking with us about conducting a situational awareness assessment for your company, or if you're interested in hosting a training program, just click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the homepage, and I'll give you a call. If you want to become part of our community of learners, there are several ways that you can do that. Check the show notes for how to get connected with us by signing up for our free monthly newsletter, by subscribing to our free SA Matters radio podcast, by subscribing to our free SA Matters TV YouTube channel, and learn how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving.
Well, that's it. Episode 298 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Fire Chief Rory Payment. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Sims You Share. Thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, and organizations and associations that have hosted Situation Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted a live stream training program where I come to your organization live via the internet to train your members. Thank you to the more than 3,500 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situation Awareness Matters Online Academy. The feedback I received from the Academy graduates is just amazing and humbling, and I thank you so much for that. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.